So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So this second letter, let me give you some basics, some fundamentals, some foundations and all to view this book through. This second letter is believed to have been written a few months after he had written the first letter. So 1 Thessalonians was written somewhere around the year A.D. 51. This followed somewhere around the same time. And it may be a response to the bearer of the first letter returning, speaking to Paul, giving him an update. And so it prompts him to write what we call 2 Thessalonians. Now, as we saw when we went through 1 Thessalonians, the church was undergoing affliction and persecution. And that was something that had begun early in the life of this particular church. When we looked at 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1, verse 5, the gospel, it's recorded there, had made a very powerful, very powerful impact on the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, Paul had said, Our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And so he said, The gospel has come to you, meaning that it was brought to you. There was a missionary, an evangelist who'd gone in, and that's what he's speaking of, and he is the one who brought it in. So our gospel, not that it originated with Paul, but it's the message Paul was giving, didn't come to you, notice, in word only. So the gospel came to him in power, evidenced by miracles and transformation of lives. The gospel had come to them in the Spirit, the Spirit who brings conviction of their need for Christ. And it came with much assurance because the confidence and the proclamation had caused them to, who were hearing it, to put their trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ as well as trusting those who were bringing it to them. The result was that the Thessalonians had become Christians, but they also began to suffer. So Paul became very concerned about them, and he, he addressed this in his first letter, and he was encouraging them to, to uh, remain strong in Christ he had made it clear that he and Jesus, they both had been persecuted, and, and therefore the, the Thessalonians should, should regard him as a model as well as obviously the model of Christ. He had said in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. You became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe, all in the Greek area, in Greece, southern and northern Greece. So persecution had arisen against him. The way that persecution had arisen against the Jewish believers, the Gentiles began to persecute um, Christians. He said in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 14, he said, You brethren became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Jews. And so he was concerned with them that they would remain firm in, in their faith in Christ. And, and so the persecution is continuing, and it prompts Paul to write this second letter. This letter is a letter of encouragement. He was concerned that they would be discouraged in their walks with Christ. He had, had said in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, that, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So they're going through persecution, but something else is happening. Not only are they undergoing persecution, but something even more dangerous than persecution is, has come upon them. False teaching. False teaching had begun to infiltrate the church, and the false teaching was now influencing the members of the body of Christ. Now we know physical affliction is terrible, but false teaching is especially dangerous. Now why would false teaching be more dangerous to the church than persecution. Well, we can endure physical pain and we can endure rejection if we have hope because hope gives us strength to endure. We know something better awaits us. When you read the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 begins by introducing us to great Bible characters of the past. 
Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah are all spoken of. And then the writer says in Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16, he says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. See, that was the hope, the hope of the future. It wasn't that they had to be especially free from pain and affliction in this life. They knew there was something better, and that was that hope that caused them to endure. Persecution has a way of purifying the church, refining the church, even giving church, the church strength. It, it, it serves as a test to refine our faith. In Romans 5, 3 and 4, uh, Paul said we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they're good for us. They help, they help us to learn to endure. And endurance develops strength of character in us. And character strengthens our confident expectation of salvation. So genuine believers, though tested, abide. They remain. And they continue with Christ throughout an entire lifetime, even through the afflictions. In Hebrews 3.14 the writer said, we've come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. So on one hand, persecution is difficult. On the other hand, false teaching is dangerous. It undermines the hope we have in the promises of the Lord that are revealed to us in Scripture. Always know this, bad teaching, bad teaching infects the church, and bad teaching will bring the church into spiritual bondage. What you believe is what you will do. And false teaching will bring you into bondage. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel writes and speaks concerning this. He said, the Lord is speaking and says, with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad. He's speaking of false teachers. With lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. You have strengthened the hands of the wicked, so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life. False teachers will actually undermine our path to salvation. And what Ezekiel was being encouraged to speak to the people is simple. He was saying, you have given the wicked a false confidence. So the worst thing is false teaching inspiring people to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the result of rejecting Jesus Christ is judgment. In John 3, 36, it says, it, it says this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So we live under the influence of the Word of God and the power of the Spirit, but bad teaching undermines the work that God wants to do. And so the key to growing and understanding is a verse-by-verse -verse study of what the Word of God would have us to understand because that saves us from false teaching. That's why in Acts 20, verse 27, Paul had said to the Ephesian elders, I have not shunned to declare to you the entire or whole counsel of God. From the A to Z, I've taught you this. Why? So that you would have the fundamentals, you would have a foundation, and you would be prepared for the error that's creeping in to steal away you away from the things of the Lord. Now, in the case of the Thessalonians, the false teaching that is being taught relates to the return of Jesus Christ. And it's the major theme that we will look at in, in uh, chapters 1 and chapter 2. Bad teaching about his return has infected the church, and the result of this is discouragement. Some were saying that the rapture had already come and gone, and that obviously causes great distress amongst the believers in the fellowship. I mean, if Jesus has already taken the church, then what about us? And so Paul is giving details concerning the conditions that will be present at that time. And so with that, in verse 1, he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he begins with an introduction that we find uh, in 1 Thessalonians also. 
He didn't need to refer to himself as Paul an apostle. Very often in his writings, he'll say Paul an apostle. He didn't have to do that here because they already know him. They know him very well. He mentions a man by the name of Silvanus. That's, uh, that's also a name for Silas. And Silas was uh, well known to them also. He is recognized as an elder as well as a prophet. And Timothy, well, they knew Timothy. He was Paul's son in the faith and very well known to the church. And so he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says to the church of the Thessalonians, they're Gentiles, but they're Christians. And he's making it clear, once again, there's no separation between Jew and Gentile. We need to remember, and I like to point this out, and I'll just say it briefly. We need to remember that the church is not to be divided into groups and subgroups. That's a big thing today. Divide our society into groups and subgroups. And in di dividing the society, you can destroy the society. Divide a house and it'll fall. And so if you can break up a nation into groups and subgroups, then you end up dividing the nation to the point where it, it will collapse. The church is not to be divided into groups and subgroups. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're uh, brown or white or black or Asian, yellow, whatever we say it today, red, it, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is red, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from sin. And that blood that cleanses me from sin has made me your brother, and you are now my family. And we need to think that way, because I'm concerned for the church in these days, that this nation, even as this nation is divided, the church can be too. Let's be one in Jesus Christ. Let's remember who we are. We belong to Him and one to one another. We need to understand that. I'd love to point that out because I really think it's something to remember today. It's not as if you don't appreciate your own culture, by the way. I love my own culture. Of course I do. There are things that I'm American, but I'm also of Mexican uh, uh, ethnicity. And I, I, I love it. I love my culture. I have no problems with my culture at all. Some people like to eat pork chops and gravy. I think that's great. Me, I like other stuff. And it's good too. I mean, if you make salsa, it's not just a tomato. You got all kinds of things in it and, it, and it's good. And I call it Mexican communion. I like it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But we can mix those things together and enjoy it together, don't you think? And that's what we ought to do. The body of Christ is not to divide you know, this isn't a Mexican church. We are a Christian church made up of Christians who love one another in Jesus Christ. That's what we are. And we, we have to keep that in mind. And so moving on, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is a common salutation during Paul's day. What he's doing is he's combining the normal greeting of the Greeks with the normal greeting of the Jew. So when a, a Greek would encounter another Greek when they were saying hello the way we would, they're simply, they would simply say charis. The word charis is grace. And that was a customary greeting. So they would say charis to one another. Now, he says grace to you because grace is the free favor of God that has been revealed in the cross of Christ on our behalf. And it's what gives us life when we give our faith to Christ because of that. In Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, it says, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And so it's the grace of God that provides salvation and provides gifting, and so grace. But he also says peace. The word peace is shalom. When you go to Israel... That's the way they will greet one another. They say shalom, and they'll say hello, shalom, and goodbye, shalom. And it speaks of, of, of peace. It, it, it is a condition that results from receiving the grace of God. When you read your New Testament and you read the letters of Paul, you're not going to see it ever said peace and grace to you. It always is grace and peace to you. Always. Why is that? It's called grace and peace to you because without God's grace, you can have no peace. You're not going to have peace until you have his grace. And that's why he would say grace to you. Grace through the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved by grace. Peace that comes through your relationship with God through Jesus. 
And so I can have peace with God. I, who at one time, because of my sin and all, was in a constant state of warfare. I was in constant hostility against God. He said, this is black. I said, this is white. He said, this is sweet. I said, this is, this is sour. I, I would, what he, when he said it was one thing, I would disagree in another way. But we were at war. We were in constant hostility. But when I heard the terms of peace, which is called the gospel of Jesus Christ, where he calls me to unconditional surrender. He is the victor, and I am the one who has been conquered. When I, I yield in that way to him, the one who has won, I now have peace with him. The way it says in Romans 5, verse 1, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But not only do I have a cessation of hostility, I have peace with him, but it also is something that he gives to me that I can have within Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So you can have peace with God when you yield to Him. You have peace from God as you, by grace, walk with Him. Now, this peace that he's speaking about, notice it says here that it, it comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll say this briefly. We are not automatically children of God. Coming from the hippie background that I came from, in ancient history, I'll bring up an ancient history illustration. We, of that, of that generation, of that mindset, we who were hippies, we would call each other brother and sister. And we actually would say things like, um, yeah, you know, we're all children of God. And I think that that is not a brand new concept. It was obviously in ancient times and it's, in, it's still infecting this day. But the Bible doesn't teach that we're automatically children of God. You might find that interesting. God is our Father by creation. He has created all things. But He is especially our Father when we yield ourselves to Him and He becomes God, my Father. That comes through being adopted into the body of Christ. We become sons and daughters through faith in His Son, Jesus. How do I know that? Well, John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 says it like this, speaking of Jesus, He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So when you gave your heart to Christ, you became a child of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ now is recognizing your life. Now I want you to notice again that he speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ. That word Lord is a word kurios. It, it, it speaks of the one who's in control. It speaks of a master. So Jesus is Lord. Ultimately, all will acknowledge that. Now, he's our Savior because we have come to him. And so I can say Jesus is my Savior, but there are those who refuse to come to him as Savior. And because they refuse him, they remain unsaved. Well, Jesus is still the Lord, regardless of whether all come to him or not. He's the Lord. He's the Lord both of believer as well as the unbeliever. And in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, it says it like this, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you can bow your knee now, or you can bow it later. But the Bible says you will bow. He is the Lord. And so he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in his introduction, that way we move into what he's saying in the body of his letter, verse 3. He says, we are bound, obligated to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. We are bound. I have an obligation. The word bound speaks of an obligation. I have an obligation to give thanks for you. It's fitting. It is proper. 
Now, what has prompted this obligation to thank God for them? Well, under fire, instead of backsliding, they have remained steadfast. And that's blessed his heart. You see, under pressure, there are those who profess to be Christians, but under pressure, they abandon that confession. Yeah, they're Christians as long as everything's smooth. Everybody's a Christian in their mind if they're not a Buddhist or, or something else. And, and I saw that to be true even when I was a younger man. It was just a common thing here in the United States. When I went into the military, when I went into the service, went into the army, we had to fill out various papers and all, all of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and as we did so, they asked questions. And one of the questions was, uh, what is your religious faith? So, you know, it's been said there are no atheists in foxholes, and that, that pretty much holds true. So people would put something. I had come to faith in Christ, and I had done so uh, and began attending Calvary Chapel ministry. And so I looked to see if they had Calvary Chapel at that time. That time they, they did not. And so I didn't know what to refer to myself as. And I didn't see an other. I don't remember it saying other. But they had a list from A to, a to basically A to Z of different religious faiths and all. And so I thought, what am I? What am I? Because I, I, if I die in battle, they're going to want a chaplain and do a particular service is what that turns out to be. And so, so I said, well, I'm a, uh, I, I, I listed myself, and I didn't know this denomination. I was listing myself as a disciple of Christ because that's what I had been taught I was to be, a follower of Jesus, a learner of Christ. And so... Everybody in the military, everybody I knew, and that's not true necessarily always, and it probably wasn't true then too, but everybody I knew uh, was putting something that they were Catholic or Baptist or whatever. Um, but it's easy to say you are something until you're under pressure. And when somebody puts you under pressure to defend what you just said, to defend your, your Christian faith, that's when a lot of people actually abandon it, especially if they're under persecution if they're being uh, spoken against, if people are, are being uh, rude and, and uh, argumentative. You're in college, and uh, as I was in college, and went to secular, non-Christian college, and, and then the minute you open your mouth, there are going to be students in the class that remember you called yourself a Christian, and later on they may bring something up to you. Maybe they want to argue with you. That happens. Uh, even professors. I mean, I, my professors, I went to Cal Poly for a while, and while I was in Cal Poly Pomona, one of my professors uh, you know, said, how many of you are born again? And, and I raised my hand along with two or three others. And, and he said, I feel sorry for you. And he immediately, I mean, the first day of class, he was feeling sorry for us because we believed in that, that little black book, he called it, that Bible. You believe that. And me, I study and, and I hold fast to, uh, to the various uh, uh, scientific studies that can actually um, give me reason to believe the things that I believe. So from the very beginning, and I've had that in other classes too, and from the beginning, they, they, they would, they would um, single you out, and then they're going to speak things against you. That's what happens. Well, some people can't handle that. Some people just say, well, you know, whatever. And, and they abandon, even as we heard earlier uh, with Josh, uh, uh, young, young people leaving high school, going into college, and abandoning any faith that they once may have professed to have held. Under pressure, professing Christians sometimes will abandon this. Now, Jesus spoke of this when he gave the parable of the sower and the soils. In Matthew 13, in verses 20 and 21, Jesus spoke of one who, he says, received the seed on stony places. He went on to say, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, Immediately he stumbles. And so, if everything's going cool and people are accepting you as a believer, that's one thing. But what happens when people begin to reject that message? I got saved in 1970. Greg Laurie made a movie about that, that time called The Jesus Revolution. Many of you perhaps saw it. A lot of people were interested in that movie. I had numbers of people asking about it. You know, was that true? Did these things happen? And, and so, yeah I, w yeah, I was part of that, and I saw that, and, and it was a great time. Yes. But you have to understand the context, too, because during that day, uh, a lot of hippies were coming to faith in Christ, and hippies already were anti-establishment. 
It didn't really matter what the conservative, even the liberal, but it didn't really matter what they thought because we were true to ourselves. That's the way it was. And, and so when I got saved, um, you know, people, people were saying things. If you're really a Christian, you, you need to, you know, um, shave your beard, you know, uh, cut your hair. And, and they were putting all of these, um, these guidelines on believers. I, I remember they were really upset with with the with uh, the beards and and we so we had to tell the girls you need to shave your beards no I don't know why don't ask me why I said that but anyway because they were uh, they you know put on some shoes and this that's the way they were and and so it was almost like a, you know what he accepts me he loves me he's changing me and we weren't really pushed I wasn't really pushed uh, to conform to other people's opinions of what I was supposed to be as a believer in Christ. It just wasn't. But that was common. That was common. But after a while, people started being pressured and pressured and pressured. And before you know it, some had, quote, unquote, received the Lord, when in fact, they just enjoyed being part of this movement that was called the Jesus Movement, but as they grew older, they abandoned any profession of faith, and I saw that happen. When I got saved, there were about eight to ten of us in a Volkswagen van, every one of them professing to be Christians. But at this time, I think over half of them have walked away from any profession of faith that they had ever made because it was kind of a cool thing at that time. I didn't get saved to be cool. I got saved because I was a sinner in need of God's grace. That's why I'm here right now, 53 years later, telling you God's grace is is great. It's wonderful. Well, their endurance gave Paul considerable joy and prompted his praise to God. Now, as we're looking at this, we're going to move into our study, and I'll touch three things, and we'll close. What is it that he was giving God thanks for? Well, basically, you'll see this. He was giving God thanks for three things, for faith, for love, and for patience. In verse 3, he says it like this, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. So their faith is outgrowing all boundaries. Now, in his first letter, he had mentioned a concern that he, he had about their faith. It, it wasn't that they didn't have faith, but it's something they needed to grow in. And so he had made that clear when he wrote 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, where he had said to them, night and day, praying exceedingly, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So every minister wants to see people not only begin, but to continue and end well. And so he's praying, and he had prayed for them that, that they, might, they might grow, might mature. And, and so he's rejoicing in the fact that God is answering his prayer. The persecution that they are enduring is refining them. They're being strengthened. The afflictions that they're enduring causes their faith to grow deeper. You may think that persecution is going to uh, destroy your faith. Persecution actually refines it. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9, the apostle said, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls." So in spite of opposition, their faith is growing, and this truly blessed him. So many simply give up in the face of opposition, but you, he said, have grown stronger. One of the things that has made the Christian church endure has been persecution. It refines us and strengthens us. When we hold fast to it, we get a deeper and greater glimpse of the God of grace that we serve and that we love. And everything that you go through, if you're going to buy it or if you're going to use it, a car or whatever, a tool of some sort or whatever, 
everything's going to go through some form of trial in order to see whether it can withstand the pressures that it's going to be used for. You buy a car, it's got to go through various things in order for that engine or transmission, whatever, to be proven to be okay. And we go through things that are trying us and proving the, uh, the reality of our faith. And, and instead of us backing down, what it does is it causes us to grow stronger. When people have, in, in my past, and yes, it's happened more than once, obviously, over the years, where people have, 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 have called into question my walk with the Lord or the reasons for believing and have, and have made uh, comments that were unkind, untrue, or difficult. Those are all things that gave me opportunity to hold fast on the things that I know are true. And they purified my faith and strengthened me, and that's the way it works. And so you're going to be tested, but it also refines you. So he thanks God. We thank God always for you. It's fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. Through the persecution, your faith rises. He's also thanking God for their love. Notice he says, their love has abounded. So the hostility they're enduring drew them closer to one another. Instead of abandoning fellowship, they increasingly depended upon one another. When one of them suffered, they all suffered along with the one who was hurting. And they listened to them, and they prayed for them, and they gave spiritual and emotional support to them. This is what they do. And so many years ago, I had the opportunity. I actually did this twice. I, I went to, to uh, India on two different occasions. I accumulated uh, 28 days. So I spent a month in India. And one of my trips in India, and we would go from the, the west to the north to the east to the south. When I went to India, we went to a particular place where we went to a church service, and in the church service, it was a, it was a house. The church that they met in was a, was a house, and it was divided. The congregation was divided so that the men sat in front, and then behind them, in other room, were the women. The house itself uh, was, there's no air conditioning, and those of you who've been to India and all, uh, you know how hot it could be, and it, it, it's well over 100 degrees and uh, 90 to 100 percent humidity. It's unbelievably hot and 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 very uncomfortable. And so they they got they don't have air conditioning, so they have they had a mirror. Uh, I'm sorry, a mirror. They had a a fan, and they put the fan in the front where the men were. And so it, it, it cooled us down. And and I remember praying and saying. Thank you, God. I don't care about those women. Thank you. No, I didn't say that. Someone's going to believe I said that. Thank you that I am a man and not a woman. But, but, but that's how it was. And so they had testimony time. And the testimony time, they have it at every service, is when you stand up and you tell people how much you suffered this week for Christ. I'll never forget that, sitting there in this church service, and this woman stands up, and she starts to talk, and you turn to look in her direction, and her right side of her face was bruised. She had a huge black eye, bruised. And she said, I told my husband about Jesus and how I love him, and he did this to me. That is every week. They, it is part of the church service. Testimony time. Anybody want to share? They stand up. I was beaten. I was chased out. My husband, that's what you hear. I remember on one occasion, I'll say this quickly, I, I knew a guy, his name was Moses Palos. And Moses and his son were ministering in a village when they were invited to come to another village that was well known for its pagan paganism, but it was also well known for its antichrist. Moses went with his son, and when they went into the village, it was all just to get him in there. And they took him to the oldest tree in the center of the village, because many of the villages in India have trees. The, the oldest one is a place of, of pagan worship. They took him, and they put him and tied him and his son to a tree. And they called for the Skinner. They have actual people in this particular radical Hindu uh, cult who skin you alive as a form of torture. So they, they called for the one who does that, the Skinner. But he was gone. He wasn't there. So instead of him being skinned alive, they took metal rods 
and beat him and his son till they almost died, released them, and told them never come back to this village again. And Moses and his son, their kidneys were destroyed from the beating. They were in horrible condition. And Moses waited until his body was healed. And he went back. And when he went back to the village, he saw people running towards him, and he's thinking, oh, no, here we go again. When they said, you've come back, you have come back, we know that we have greatly offended your God because the tree that we tied you to, the place of our idolatrous worship, the tree that we tied you to died. And we know that we have offended your God, and we have been hoping that you would return to tell us what you had originally come to tell us. And Moses shares how he went in with his son and was able to bring an entire village to the faith of Jesus Christ through preaching the gospel. So when we, amen. So see, a lot of times we think that persecution only occurred in 2,000 years ago and maybe. No, it, it happens to this day. And those are things that happen. And so what it is, it's, it's a demonstration that, that your faith is genuine and God has a way of, of causing this uh, to really build up the life and uh, the heart of the church. So he's very blessed because they love one another. And in spite of what they're going through, they're caring for one another. And that is the mark of a believer. There was a, a writer, uh, <laughs> excuse me, by the name of Tertullian. Uh, he's called an early church father. He lived around 150 to 225 A.D., and he was what is called an apologist, and he would share uh, a defense of the Christian faith. And, and this is something that is uh, attributed to Tertullian, where he said that the Christians' deeds of love were so noble that the pagan world confessed in astonishment, behold, how they love one another. And that's the kind of love that makes an impact on people living in a loveless world, knowing how important love is Paul prayed that they would grow in love. In 1 Thessalonians 3.12, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and, and to all, just as we do to you. In 1 Thessalonians 4.9 and 10, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Indeed, you do so toward all the brethren in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So the times of pressure they were enduring is producing love. As they're going through pain and persecution, they're caring for one another. And then finally, they're exhibiting great patience in the face of these persecutions. He says in verse 4, uh, We ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So we boast of you in private conversations and even in church services perhaps about what God is doing in you. And this statement reveals what actually should matter to a minister of the gospel. Paul gloried in their patience and faith as they were enduring persecution. In spite of the affliction, in spite of the opposition, you have remained strong. I'm concerned for your spiritual state, and this blesses my heart. So in face of the rejection and the affliction and the persecution, you are exhibiting great patience. Now, in the New Testament, patience isn't defined as weak submissiveness. Sometimes we think, oh, that guys, they're, they're so weak. They're just, oh. No, patience speaks of heroic endurance in the face of great trouble and pain. There was an organized and concentrated persecution, but in spite of this, they remained fast in the Lord. They trusted God like the psalmist in Psalm 56, verse 3 says, Whenever I'm afraid, I trust in you. So Paul was blessed. These young believers stood strong in Christ. Under persecution, they held fast. Why? Because their, their lives are rooted and grounded in Jesus, who is the true vine. And he is the foundation of our Christian faith and our Christian walk. And God's love is the evidence of his salvation. And Jesus is the center of our attention. And love is the fuel that makes you faithful to the one you love. So he rejoices because their faith and their love is demonstrated by their patience. And he is 
soothed by the continuation and fruit. So faith, love, and patience is exhibited in the face of prolonged aggressive hatred. And his heart is overcome with relief and gratitude. And he can use them as an example. He's saying, you are an example of what a Christian is. In the face of persecution, you have remained faithful. And you have been thoroughly convinced of the truth of the gospel. Finally, every one of us in this room who's a believer in Jesus Christ, every one of us will have an opportunity, a multitude of times more than likely, no less than once, to turn away from the Lord and walk away. Everyone will. Every single one of you will. Every single one of you. It reminds me of what it says in John 6, where it says in verses 66 through 69, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now also we have come to believe and know you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, to whom shall we go? Do I want to go away? Have I ever been put in the position where I hear the voice of the Lord saying to me, do you want to go away? And the answer to that is yes. I've had that happen more than once where I actually have a sense of the voice of the Lord as if he were speaking audibly, speaking to my heart. Do you want to go away? And I remember one time when I was going through a very tough time in my early Christian walk. And I was sitting in my parents' front room in den, and I said, God, I, where can I go? Because I had read just the first portion, do you want to go away? And I remember closing my Bible saying, where can I go? Where can I go? I've left everything behind. I've left all my, I don't have friends anymore. My whole life has been built around trying to serve you. Where do I have to go? And I still remember to this day how I, I had just read that portion, do you also want to go away? And I said, where can I go? And then I read the second portion, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. And I remember closing the Bible and, and crying, weeping to the Lord and saying, I know you're speaking to me through this. I know that the, the end of my life is going to be better than the beginning. I know that you have something planned for me. And what did he have planned for me? Part of what he had planned for me is for me to be here right now talking to you about how good God is and what he will do. <laughs> what he is and what he'll do. Hold fast. Love one another. Remain patient and see what God will do.